Hi everyone, hope you're all okay. As you can see, I'm back at work now after 11 weeks working from home. I've been back a few weeks now. Keith is camera shy as usual, so he's not wanting to say hello, but he misses you all too, as I do. Can't wait till we all come back to church and raise the roof and sing some of our belting hymns that we do. See you all soon. Take care now. Bye bye. Hi Wendy, it's Hi lovely everyone. to see you. <laughs> How are you doing? All right, yeah, not too bad. What have yeah. you been doing with yourself? Um, all sorts of things. Been really busy, um, doing all sort of mum stuff. Because um, you've got a, a son, how old is he? He's 15. Is he? Yeah. What's his name? William. Yeah, all sorts of mum stuff, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, just mum stuff, shopping and all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, being busy. Um, I've done some art. Yeah, very creative, aren't you? For those of you that don't know, Wendy's a very, very talented artist. What have you been doing? Oh, I've done a, um, uh, a picture of, uh, sort of an abstract picture of um, it's Christ the Redeemer, the statue looking over Rio. Mm. Oh, you've put that on Facebook, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what else have you been doing? Anything? Um, watching a bit, I like morning telly, I like this morning because it seems like a bit of company. Um, I bought some puzzle books, Sudoku, and that sort of thing. Um, just started going out a little bit to the town centre. Um, about yeah so you're starting to do a bit of normal things yeah which must feel nice after all this time yeah yeah so lovely to see you face to face hi Jenny how you doing hi Alison yeah we're, we're getting there slowly very slowly yeah yeah looking forward to getting back in the church and getting back to the exercise class but when the, you know, although the exercise class is starting, when will we all be back in the church? That's Who one knows? of those questions that we can't answer at the yeah. moment, isn't it? But you're, you're okay in yourself, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Morning all. I give thanks that we're able to meet as we do and welcome you to today's service. I thank God for the technology that enables to meet us to meet and I thank God for all of you and everything you are doing for one another. This week, we will begin our house groups in the chapel at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 1st of September and 1.30 on Thursday, the 3rd of September. Please bring your own refreshments and your own Bibles. Probably that should have been around the other way, but you know what I mean. Please let me know if you need a lift, that can be arranged. There will also be badminton in the church hall on Tuesday the 1st of September in the evening and we will meet to do the garden next Saturday the 5th of September at 9.30. The living God continues to move among us and we give thanks. Let's just take a moment to invite him to meet with us in our homes today. A moment of quiet. Loving Lord, we offer you our praise, acknowledge you as our God, ruler of all, giver of life, the beginning and end of all things. We offer you our hymns, our prayers and readings, our words and thoughts, our money and our lives. We offer you the week ahead, however unfamiliar things are. You are in every hour of every day. We offer you our hopes and fears, our gifts and interests, our time and our energy. Sovereign Lord, fill us with your power. Help us to spread your love to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. Hi everyone. It's the Wednesday of the Holiday Club. Um, and actually I don't need a darkened room. Um, Holiday Club was fabulous. It was very different from our usual um, holiday clubs, but we really did build some good relationships with the children. Um, we had lots of fun and frivolity and huge engagement with the children in terms of listening to and joining in with the stories and praying, as well as being really creative between the morning and afternoon sessions. The teaspoon prayers went really well and the children really got it. So I would just like to say thank you to everyone who prayed for us. We really did appreciate it. Well, holiday club is over, so it must be nearly time for me to go back to school. But before I do, I just want to share with you some reflections from my summer holiday. Now, as a teacher, I sort of feel that my summer holiday is just a gift of time to relax, to get rid of my to-do list, and to do the stuff that I don't usually have the time or the energy to do. At the beginning of the holiday, I did two online festivals. The first one was the Keswick Convention. The theme was hope and was very much based around great Bible teaching. And as a result, I was really challenged about why my friends at school don't see my faith as so attractive that they want to find out more for themselves. They're happy to acknowledge my faith and beliefs, but that's as far as it goes. So I began to ask God what needs to change in me. The week after that, I did new wine from the comfort of my living room and the worship was absolutely fa fabulous. The focus was on the Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit. The range of seminars was really great and seemed to focus on the things that I've been thinking about. And I think that God has said to me, it's not about you. It's about my power working through you and in you. Let me overflow you with my spirit and your faith will be contagious. I'll let you know how that goes once I'm back at school. Also this summer, I've been thinking about that big question, what next? And I'd love to say that God drew a big arrow in the sky to show me the way forward, or that he sent me an email det detailing my next steps. But that isn't really how God works. Instead, he asked me some questions. Where is your confidence? Is it in yourself or is it in me? Are you ready to step out of your comfort zone? I'm still not sure what next, but know that God is calling me to increase my confidence in him. To, for him to work in me so that I can take that next step of faith when I am asked and to be courageous in all that I do. When we were young and fearful of the dark, it would make all the difference if her parents or big brother was there to protect us. On a far grander scale, when we have the protection of the most powerful being in the universe, how can anything make us afraid? God's light delivers us from the darkness of this evil world. His strength saves us and alleviates our fears. We can entrust him with our worries about our health, finances, needs and future. He cares for us and offers peace that surpasses all understanding to guard our hearts and minds. Hello everyone. 
My moment this week is a call to prayer, if you don't mind. I work at Harlow College and this has been my second full week back on site, preparing for and delivering inductions, contacting new students, working with social workers, just trying to do my normal job. And it is all very strange. There's a nat natural anxiety amongst some learners, a new start, a new college, new people, and some staff are actually naturally concerned about how things will work for them, getting to know their learners and teaching online or delivering support in a new way. So I'd like us to pray, if possible, for all schools, colleges and universities, for the staff that they feel protected and are able to deliver their sessions or do what they need to do, feeling safe and supported. And we know for some, both staff and students, school or college or uni, is their safe space. Please pray that this will remain the case. And I'd like us all to pray for the students, from the very youngest to the very oldest, for encouragement, for the natural anxiety about starting school, changing classes or changing the setting. And may they receive and enjoy the education that they deserve. And may they all feel God's love close to them. Have a good week, everybody. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You wanted us in heaven with you, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater, what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is, what a name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a wonderful name it is, and nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. The veil torn before you, you silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no now and forever, our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, 
What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no equal. Now I'm forever. Our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Lovely to see you. Hi, Alison. It's How lovely. you been? Lovely to see you. It's nice to see you face to face, isn't it? After all this yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> How you been doing? Not good. No. No. It was all right at first. Um, 
When we first went into lockdown, I knew from the start I was going to be a very high risk. Um, but I thought, oh, you know, a couple of weeks and we'll be, it'll all be over. No. Um, I was all right until I started getting like letters from the government. Even the letter, first letter from the government didn't really sink in, I think is the right words. Yeah. I sort of read it and I thought, oh, it doesn't tell me anything, I don't know. Then I started getting phone calls from the doctors, which that did panic me because our doctors, you have to have eight nails in your coffin before you can see a doctor. <laughs> then I started getting phone calls from the hospital and I thought this is a lot more serious than I thought and that's when the panic really set, set in. Um, You've been quite wobbly haven't you? Pardon? You've been quite wobbly. Mm. Um, I've been guilty, very guilty because Frank couldn't go out because of me. Um, my joints were seizing up. Because you have arthritis, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and osteoporosis. And you so, haven't been able to have your treatment? Yeah, no treatment because of it, which didn't make me feel any better. Mm. Um, but once they started lifting it, I started doing a little bit, bit of exercise and um, I've found that that has helped. Good. And um, the more I do, the more I'm getting movement in my joints. Brilliant. I wouldn't say I'm back to normal because I'm not. I'm no, far no. from normal. It's left left me with a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Um. But you just said to me a minute ago that you feel God's kind of helping you to take the first steps now? Yeah, I've, um, each, each phase I'm trying to take a step and I, I pray to the Lord that I'm going to be able to do that step and get over it and then I can concentrate on the next one. And you've managed to come out today, which was a huge step. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I was absolutely petrified walking into that hall. Mm. I thought there was going to be a load of people there. And it wasn't the people. I mean, I know every one of them, and they're all lovely. But it was the amount of people together. Mm. Mm. The most I've mixed with is... My Sam, Frank, and Peter. Mm. Um, even when I go shopping, I'm sort of going round like mm. a whirlwind. Yeah. Can't wait to get out of it. Yeah. And yes, I'm the one up the town centre that comes out of the shop and goes the wrong way down the one way system <laughs> and gets a tap on the shoulder by a nice young man and says, <laughs> You're going the wrong way, madam. <laughs> but I think that what you wanted to say as well is that you really feel God's now leading you forward. Yeah. And that one day at a time. Yeah. Yeah, one day at a time, one step at a time. Yeah. And it's really helpful for us to hear how you've dealt with it because many people haven't been able to say that out loud, have they? No. And no. I, think, I think that's very I, helpful. I, I think as well, I think... To a certain extent, some people just don't understand what people, some people have gone through. Yeah. It, 
Yeah. It hasn't affected them. Not like it has affected you, no. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, just want to share a few, uh, uh, something of good news with you all, which probably a lot of you will know by now. About, f um, well, let's go back to January of this year. I was 55 and was being told by my friends, oh, you can go and live in Jack Stevens Close. You're old enough. So um, I got the forms, or should I say, Anne, Anne Mellaf very kindly got the forms for me and I completed the application form. Lo and behold, two or three weeks later, back came um, a letter from Riverside Housing to say I was number three on the waiting list. So I thought, OK, that sounds that's really good. Um, really pleased about that. Then we had a uh, lockdown, obviously nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, uh, three weeks ago, um, I was just about to have a few days off work. I got a call from Riverside to say, would I like to view uh, a flat in uh, Jack Stevens Close? So off we went to view it uh, one particular Thursday. And um, as I was just about to go and view the property, met the housing lady. Um, she said to me, just want to say to you now, I need a decision today because I have 11 people in line to view this. So that straight away um, swayed me a little bit. And then went inside and looked around and the flat was amazing. From living in a, a room, a shared house where um, the bathroom, the kitchen was all shared. You know, you had to fall in line with other people. Um, to a flat that is amazing size. Um, was just unbelievable. It was an answer to prayer. And I accepted the place and I recently moved in to number six, Jack Stevens Close in Harlow. Um, um, I want to thank you all for your many prayers, cards and amazing donations that some of you have made of of items um, for the house. It's just amazing. I've been overwhelmed, actually. But it has been a great answer to prayer and I believe all along this journey it has been God-led. Uh, God has been with us in everything in what he is doing. Uh, the, the place is nearer to, the, the flat is nearer to where I work when I actually will be able to go back into the office um, it's got some lovely places to go and do some walks. It means I get about more for my health. I think it will be a lot better as well. So again, many thanks um, for all your prayers as well for this. And I just hope now that you all, all keep safe and well during um, this difficult times we're in. I just want to leave you with the words of a hymn. It's a very old hymn, and I think it's a Catholic hymn. Um, that's come to mind to me. Uh, the words are, Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come follow me and I will give you rest. And I believe that is the Lord just saying, you know, whatever we're going through these difficult times, he's there with us. He's already gone ahead. He's prepared the way. Yes, we don't know what that way is, but he's there for us. Keep safe, everyone, and let's hope you see each other soon. God bless. Faith is not through stained glass nor sweet religious props, fantasy like unless it is made real in the way, interact with people. Cooperating with God is in changing me rather than taking refuge in piously berating myself. Not related to my believing hard enough nor my emotional exhilaration or flatness, but rests on what God guarantees in his word. Not faith in faith itself, but faith in the facts of scripture, fact of Christ's death, fact of his resurrection. Not a vague hope of a happy forever after, but an assurance of heaven based on my trust in Christ's death, as payment for my sins. Father, we thank you that you are a God who does not sleep and who is delighting in the prayers brought to you by your people. So today we bring our prayers for our world, for our country and for one another to you. We look around our world, Lord, and we see this virus, COVID-19, and its impact. And I bring to you the increases, Lord, that those countries are currently experiencing. In Europe, 
in Australia and in Latin America. Lord, be with them. We see countries experiencing natural disasters and storms like Pakistan, Niger and Australia. And countries, Lord, where there is still civil unrest. India, Hong Kong, America, Belarus. And those countries where they're suffering the impact of war with refugees. Libya, Syria, Palestine and Lebanon. Lord, so much that we could despair of. But I thank you, Lord, that we have hope in you and that the brutality and suffering that we see in our world is not the last word, that one day your justice will be done. In the meantime, Lord, we ask that you have compassion and that you meet the needs of these people. We lift our country to you, Lord, and there are areas of our own country that are still experiencing extra lockdown and the difficulties that that brings. And there are rising numbers, Lord, of the uh, numbers of people with COVID-19 being reported. Lord, be with our government as they seek to govern and manage this um, outbreak, the difficult task that they have, Lord. Be with them and give them wisdom. We think of this next week and right across the country, all those schools and children returning. Lord, be with all of the teachers, all of the workers who are working hard to um, put in safety measures. And Lord, we lift our town to you, Harlow, and we give thanks for the work of all your church across the town, finding new and innovative ways to still maintain contact with people in their communities and in churches. And we give you thanks for those with gifts to use technology to keep us all connected. And we lift our local government to you and ask, Lord, that they would cope with the extra increase of responsibility of dealing with testing and finding people who have the virus and all the recording and safety measures that are needed. And we lift ourselves to you, Lord, our church, our PSBC, and we give you thanks, Lord, for each other, for the kindness and generosity that's been shown in keeping in touch and making sure that each person is connected. And we lift those that are sick and need a special touch from you. We think of Jenny recovering. Lord, heal her quickly and restore her to health. We think of Doris, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would grant her comfort in the last days of her life. We ask, Lord, for healing for Miriam Miriam's daughter and for Lana's family too, Lord. In your mercy and compassion, Lord, bring healing and restoration. We think of those that are still grieving the loss of loved ones and we ask for your peace and comfort for those. And we think of all those in our church that are returning to school this week. We think of those everyone that works with children and young adults. Lord, keep them safe and for the children too and grant peace and assurance for any um, doubts or reservations that they may have. Lord, we thank you that you are our God and that you are in control that you are almighty, sovereign, ever-present God who grants us hope for the future because of your faithfulness in the past. Hear our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.
John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple, walking through the section, a section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. The father and I are one. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him Jesus said, At my Father's direction, I have done many good works. 
For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, We are stoning you, not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus replied, It is written in your own scriptures that God said to certain leaders of the people, I say, you are gods, and you know that the scriptures cannot be altered. So if those people who received God's message were called gods, why do you call it blasphemy when I say, I am the Son of God? After all, the Father set me apart and sent me into the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done, even if you don't believe me. Then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Once again, they tried to arrest him, but he got away and left them. He went beyond the Jordan River, near the place where John was first baptizing, and stayed there a while and many followed him. John didn't perform miraculous signs, they remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true, and many who were there believed in Jesus. Thanks, Vitalis. I think the passage starts in an odd place today. Time has moved on and we are told it is now winter. Maybe this isn't just a comment about the weather, but I will return to that. Jesus has been in Jerusalem since his arrival for the festival of booths or shelters, teaching regularly in the temple complex. His teaching continues to be controversial, causes a lot of discussion about his identity, his origin and his authority. His presence and teaching has resulted in a division among the people. From previous chapters, we know that some believe that he is the Messiah, Others believe that he is demon possessed or worse, a blasphemer who deserves to die. And last week, if we spoke of the Good Shepherd, the Jews remained divided. Many of them were saying he was a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? It is not clear how much time has passed between that discussion and today's passage that we are told takes place at the time of the festival of dedication, which we might recognize as Hanukkah. This festival celebrates the day the Jews regained the temple and Jerusalem from the Syrian king Antiochus. Antiochus had tried to force Greek philosophy and religion on the Jews. He had attacked Jerusalem, he had looted the temple treasury, and he had desecrated the altar by sacrificing a pig on it. He had built an altar to Zeus. Judas Maccabeus and his brothers gathered an army, liberated Jerusalem, cleansed the temple and rededicated the altar. And the festival of Hanukkah is observed with the lighting of lamps and much rejoicing and it commemorates that rededication. It continues to be celebrated to this day, midwinter, and it coincides often with our Christmas. Is it a coincidence that Hanukkah celebrates the rededication of the temple. The temple represents the presence of God with his people. And Jesus has already revealed earlier on in John that he is the new temple. All right, Jesus replied, don't de destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What, they exclaimed, it's taken 46 years to build the temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said, this temple, he meant his own body. So just as Antiochus had disrespected and defiled the temple, the religious leaders are disrespecting Jesus, the new temple. Hanukkah celebrates the day that Israel regained control of the temple and reconsecrated re it to the one true God, the God of Israel. And I think for Jesus, the problem might be that they are celebrating the reconsecration of the temple but they are not re-consecrating themselves to God. Several commentaries suggest that that is why there is a reference to winter. The Jews stand frozen in the past. 
Their hardened hearts cannot hear Jesus' words. They cannot understand his works or recognise who he is. They fail to experience the eternal life of God in the here and now. They refuse to see Jesus, the Messiah, in the changing of water into wine, in the feeding of the 5,000, in the healing of the lame and sick, or in the raising of Lazarus from the dead, even in the commandment to love God and each other. Each year, I do a rededication service near the beginning of January, and in order that we might think of our commitment and our relationship with God and remember all that he has done for us. That is what Hanukkah should have been about. I should perhaps just add that every time it says Jews in this passage, it's speaking of the Jewish leaders, not really the Jewish people. Remember the Jewish people were following Jesus around from one place to another, bringing their sick for him to heal. And they were far less concerned about him doing these things on a Sabbath and were at the very least intrigued by what they saw. And some of them were believing as a result. I think it might be helpful for us as well to understand why the Jewish leaders have such a problem accepting Jesus as the Messiah. Remember that the Pharisees' role in society is to uphold and maintain the Jewish law, to encourage the people to obey the law. They're not priests. They knew the law backwards. So what exactly is it that they are measuring Jesus against? What do they believe the Messiah will bring to their people? Now, the Jews associate the coming of the Messiah with a specific stream of events, which to this day have not happened. They believe that the Messiah will be a paternal descendant of King David. That they will be returned to their homeland, the promised land that God gave them. So God's kingdom will be a physical place with an address and borders. They believe that the temple will be rebuilt. And the Messiah will herald peace on earth and that the knowledge of God will fill the earth. And at the time of Jesus, that would have meant freedom from bondage under Rome and being restored to the height of their popularity. And they also expected that as a result of the peace and popularity, other nations would realise how much they had mistreated Israel. Jews hold to the fact that none of these events have happened during or since Jesus' lifetime, so he cannot be the Messiah. So what else do they believe? Now if we think about this, much of this could have only have been formulated since the crucifixion and resurrection. But they believe in one God who cannot be represented in three persons. They say that the Torah, the law, rules out the possibility of a Trinitarian God. God cannot assume any physical form, does not have any physical characteristics, and cannot be understood. He's unfathomable. God is infinite, eternal, beyond time and space, cannot be born or die. And according to them, it's the highest heresy for any man to claim to be God, to be part of God or the son of God. That most certainly in their eyes is idolatry. There is no concept in the law of the Messiah fulfilling the law so that Jews can be free from it. And one of the deciding factors for them is that Jesus died on a wooden cross. And in the law, it says that a man who dies on a tree will be cursed. Deuteronomy 23 says, if someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging overnight. You must bury the body that same day. For anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed in the sight of God. In this day, you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God has given you as your special possession. The Messiah could not be cursed in the sight of God. Back to today's passage, and with all that in mind, much of which perhaps would only have been formulated since his death and over time, but still there are serious objections to Jesus' claims. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus says, I told you. I told you. That is what the door was about. That is what the good shepherd was about. Him telling them he would lay down his life. He is the one who will have authority given him by his father. He is the one who will gather the people to live forever in joy. He says, I told you. That's my answer. 
And then he adds in verse 25, the proof is the work I do in my father's name. Not only have I told you, I have shown you. The word and the work reveal his identity clearly as far as he is concerned. Now, the problem, of course, is that regardless of what Jesus says or does, they can't or won't see that. Jesus says, I've already told you, and that I've shown you, and I've done it in my Father's name so that he is revealed. But they do not believe, not because they are not his, they do not believe because they are not his sheep. Jesus revealed himself plainly to the Samaritan woman and the man born blind but not to these men because they're not interested in the truth. They are purely looking for grounds to convict him. They do not believe, not because Jesus is not a shepherd, but because they are not sheep. They are the ones who Jesus identified as thieves, bandits and hired hands who come to steal, kill and destroy. Thieves and bandits hate good shepherds because a good shepherd presents them from carrying out their evil intentions. Jesus also resists the title of Messiah with them because of the expectations that went in it with that. The Pharisees expected a Messiah like King David, a warrior king who would re-establish Israel as a great nation. And Jesus' Messiahship would look quite different to their expectations. The words and works of Jesus are being measured through all the objections I have already mentioned. But going back one chapter to the man born blind, to highlight what I just said, the Pharisees see only that Jesus has healed on a Sabbath, therefore he must be a sinner. While others question how a sinner can perform such signs, the blind man gradually comes to realise who Jesus is, and in the end he worships him as Lord. It is only with the eyes of faith that you can see the truth concerning Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus, who hear and recognise his voice and follow him, are saved. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. No amount of words from Jesus can argue people into faith. All he can do, and therefore all we can do, is to declare the promise that creates and sustains faith. faith the promise of the Good Shepherd, who gives us eternal life. The promise in today's passage that no one will be able to snatch us from his hand. There are many voices that tell us how to grow closer to God by having a prescribed religious experience, by believing the correct doctrine, by reaching a higher level of knowledge or a higher level of morality. And the Good Shepherd tells us that everything depends on belonging to him. Never does our status before God depend on how we feel, on having the right experience, on being free of doubt, or on what we accomplish. It depends on how, it depends on one thing only, that we are known by the shepherd, and that we know the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Now it is at this point that the Pharisees hear blasphemy. He's making himself equal with God, the same as God. They weren't misunderstanding him. They just did not believe him. And the response to that belief is to act according to the law and stone him. But what was he saying to the sheep who knew his voice? He's saying, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. This isn't about longevity. This is about life lived in the presence of God. The voice of the Good Shepherd is a voice that frees us rather than convicts us. It does not say, do this and then maybe you'll be good enough to be one of my sheep. It says, you belong to me. No one can snatch you out of my hand. And secure in this place of belonging, we are free to live the life that Jesus spoke of earlier in this chapter. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This abundant life is not necessarily about many years or abundance in years or in wealth, in status or accomplishments. It's life that is abundant in the love of God made known in Jesus Christ, love that overflows to others.
amidst all the other voices, voices that bring fear, voices that make demands or give advice, the voice of the Good Shepherd is a voice of promise, a voice that calls us by names and claims us as God's own. Be someone who knows the voice of the Shepherd. Respond to that voice and let him give you the security only he can give. The final words in today's passage say, and many who were there believed in Jesus. As always, I ask you, are you among the believers? It really does matter to me that you are. Get in contact if you want to know more. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. A moment to consider. A song we haven't sung for a while. Into your hands I commit again, all I am for you, Lord. You hold my world in the palm of your hand and I am yours forever.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all. Amen.